Hello everyone, today we talk about Andrew in England from the rise of Henry II to the English throne to the death of King John. As in my previous video about Anglo-Norman England, I do not pretend to provide with an exhaustive um, information set, let's put it in this way, uh, for such, mm, actually, first of all, important um, topics, secondly, very documented ones, so we will surely come back on these monarchs uh, individually uh, in detail, also just certain specific aspects of their reign with dedicated videos. And also, of course, because I talk uh, mostly to uh, an Anglo-American audience that is well acquainted, hopefully, uh, with these topics in particular. Uh, thus, I will proceed by trying as I do in general, to provide with a broader insight or background or perspective, and just also my my take uh, on the reign, essentially, of these three monarchs, um, Henry II, Richard I, uh, uh, who we discussed in, in other videos, and John, that we also, of course, named in multiple videos about, for example, the Battle of Bouvines, the the Magna Carta, that made lots of videos about the political and institutional development of England and France compared, so much that I created actually a, a playlist titled exactly England and France, Medieval England and France compared, because um, of course these two countries um, had not just a very deep political and military intertwinement, but also shared at some point, or at least they, they influenced each other's uh, institutional uh, development. Right, the bailiffs, for example, in 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 France, in Capet in France, are definitely inspired to the to the English itinerant judges. And naturally, there is all a surrounding context, not just the, the broader international one. Just think about the Crusades, etc. But take the the British Isles altogether with the Celtic fringe. The of course dramatic, com dramatically composite nature of France. That when we speak of the Angevins in particular here and their so-called empire, uh, we, uh, we, we exalt as such, right? having this enormous territory that de facto, at least in terms of in strong political influence and compass, England, essentially all Western France, from Brittany to, to Gascony uh, in, in latitude, but also the Irish eastern coast, uh, and even more in, in the in the depths of the French hinterland, um, and, and so on. So, we start essentially from where we have stopped last time on uh, the video of Anglo-Norman England, right? It's the rise of Henry II after the death of King Stephen. Essentially, Henry was the son of Mathilde, that was the granddaughter of William the Conqueror, Stephen also was. Um, so we're talking properly about the Norman dynasty um, as such, except that by main lines, uh, of course, these uh, individuals had taken uh, other, on, um, other, other titles. Stephen was Count of Blois, Henry was in fact Count of Anjou. And these were some of the most powerful principalities in continental France, as we've seen the Normans and the Angevins would essentially, in fact, be French kings. They spoke French. We don't even understand sometimes, like for, for example, Richard, uh, whether he even understood or spoke any English. Um, and their, of course, historiographical consideration has been an important object of study because of the centrality of England in Western history and um, in world history and in, in the influence that the Anglosphere had just in the way we make history uh, in the West. So it's definitely fascinating to look at these characters in detail, but sometimes we, we don't know that, that, that much. And during the 12th century, there is a, a very important um, development at all levels of European civilization for which we start getting way more sources, so way more insight and information but at the same time, we we are not looking at, at in any time at objective sources, right? And there is a considerable bias for which certain um, 
let's say interpretations certain things have stuck somehow uh, in popular imagination just think about King John right that is the villain basically of the situation that I instead consider one of the most capable rulers um, and surely proving to be actually also a more um, politically shrewd one than his brother uh, Richard for example but there is also this underlying the in the Angevin period this underlying political instability due mostly to feudal matters the great revolt of Henry's children of course you, you perfectly know we were talking about Richard and John that, would, uh, that count as monarchs are Henry's children with Eleanor of Aquitaine that had previously been uh, uh, the wife uh, the, and the, at this point the divorced wife of King Louis the Seventh of France so there was an enormous rivalry at that point within this enormous domain that um, entailed naturally also some sort of uh, inheritance partition. England had always been somehow more unitary and compact than the the, the French domains, but the latter were um, were still considered as more important, or at least there was more um, there were more political opportunities, right, in working, especially against the Capetians, in conjunction with other uh, surrounding powers to essentially even um, aim at the, the destruction of the Capetian monarchy per se, the, the installment in even as as um, of, of the Angevins of the Romans as French kings. At least this would be evident later uh, during the Hundred Years' War that literally was uh, a war, a uh, dynastic war fought over in fact the, the rights on the same French crown. This is a, a different context but everything is so intertwined that of course um, the difficulties of keeping the whole possessions together um, invest the same the same ruling uh, the same royal fame and the great revolt is one of uh, Henry the young king that is not considered an English king because he was associated by Henry his father to the throne, but fundamentally without much power. This is essentially what, um, after Henry's death by the center during one of the, the, the campaigns waged against his father, would uh, would be planned also for Richard uh, at some point. So this was a need, evidently, of the anglo angevin dynasty, in as much as, especially England, constituted uh, a land of conquest, and as such, it was not it was considered properly as a private possession, not differently in the sense from, from the others, but the fact it had been taken over from, from scratch without too much a huge blow, 1066, in spite of further revolts and so on, still mm, had allowed the monarchy to regard not just England per se, but also the this enormous amount of lands that had been then dynastically accumulated over time as the mm, at least being provided with a potential for a dramatic centralization and as we've seen uh, this potential was definitely there um, England was mm, by far one of the single most centralized countries in Latin Germanic Europe um, in, in politically institutionally and just some objective catastrophe that um, occurred for pretty random reasons at the end of the day. It could be biological ones, the death of a hair, like the one of Henry I, um, and uh, the, the Battle of Bouvines, literally a single battle, right, that would dramatically undermine the enormous potential of, uh, centralizing potential of the English market. I made a video specifically on this topic, if you check my medieval England playlist, I, I discuss it at, at length, because especially what we will terminate together with in terms of the Magna Carta uh, is, um, as you know, celebrated as one of the greatest moments, say, in the definition of what would become, in fact, the future political institutional order of the Kingdom of England. In general, the, the affirmation of the rights of the English people, um, say, as in, in, say, in relation with monarchic power, but in perspective, together with the civil war that had um, 
opposed, in fact, uh, the, the, the Andrevins to, to the Normans before Henry II came to the throne, plus the various revolts occurring under his children, were enormously disrupted of an order that could have been by far one of the single most, again, centralized and, and powerful in Europe, and that set was significantly reduced. Um, eventually, also, this was not; these were not the sole factors per se. But um, that ruling, let's say, the possibility of, of seeing much more than we think normally already highly of England, like dur during the Middle Ages. So after the death of King Stephen in 1154, um, the path had already been prepared essentially for the succession of Henry II. Um, telling the truth that the peace had been uh, fragile, but uh, for dynastic reasons it was rightfully recognized at that point that the most, um, most legitimate heir should have definitely been Henry, that in this regard managed to essentially put an end and to pacify uh, all the main conflicts that had agitated um, England during essentially the, the civil war had split into the country, especially the, the island, but of course also the, the French mainland, um, and had eroded dramatically what had been properly the, the monarchic authority. Um, Henry had already married Eleanor of Aquitaine, so that uh, had brought this enormous amount of land in southwestern France, um, so in the center of France, plus he was Count of Anjou, um, he uh, had his extensive holdings in Normandy as well, from which the, his ancestors had conquered the same England. And England in this became a key part of the loser, uh, neat assemblage of lands spread across Western Europe that we call today, because at the time the term would, did not, uh, was not applied for it, uh, Angevin Empire, right? Which makes sense, at least if you want to approximate, in meaning that exactly England starts um, acquiring an ever greater centrality, right? In, in the first decades after the, the Norman conquest, it, it still was considered secondary, right? It was definitely the most important chunk because the kingdom was was very big. Um, but um, the French possessions had been somehow still more relevant and just the, the Norman establishment preferred them over, over the British ones. And, and at, at this point instead, in spite of the fact that, as we've seen, uh, Eleanor brought in dowry this, this enormous amount of lands in southern France that extensionally were larger than, than the British possessions of the Angevins, still England began to, you know, to be the, the, the ground for the, effectively the construction of, of, a, of a permanent center. Um, and Henry II, as we will see, is credited for having boosted further, essentially what had been um, carried out by his um, grandfather, Henry I, that had already significantly strengthened the central or uh, the central or organisms or of uh, government with the creation of the exchequer the introduction of the itinerant judges and um, at this point Henry was mostly involved in recovering of course what had the, the the royal rights that had been usurped and avoiding the sense kind of a private disgregation due to the baronial uh, autonomies that had increased disproportionately after literal decades of civil war within the country, especially in the north. In fact, we will see that the, the major rebellions against later also the, the Angevin monarchs, including the St. John um, after Bouvine, uh, started mostly from this so-called northern alliance. So in perspective, mm, just to stress the connection with the fact that, you know, it wasn't really a, a positive thing to have had a Magna Carta from a monarchic perspective, but possibly also for, for the country entirely, is that the main opposition wasn't coming from, let's say, the most civilized uh, Saxon South, right? And, and or even from Normandy, 
that was also quite advanced, but rather from mostly the Midlands, right? And also what an important influence from the northern neighbors, such as the Scots, uh, also the Welsh, that as we will see, were part of a broader frontier that instead the the Anglo-Saxons uh, and the Normans, uh, and the Angevins now, were instead regarding as essentially a possession of their own. It had to be reaffirmed just as the confirmation that the, the Kingdom of England had an ever greater need for this uh, full political and territorial uh, stabilization and also capacity to fundamentally lord over other lands, as we will see now. In fact, um, during the Angevin Empire, Henry asserted his authority on, on the Celtic fringe, not just in, in Britain, but in France as well, because Brittany that I made a video on, introductively on, on, on the topic, um, and was surrounded by other Angevin possessions, was overlorded by Henry, right? The, the, the province didn't have a great deal of centralization because it was somehow a more primitive land, but it was an important chunk, right, that could secure their important communications between the, the various domains of the Angevin em Empire. It had important potential also say politically military and as we will see the Angevin Empire is uh, characterized also by uh, an increased bureaucratic um, development that was needed especially to finance troops right that could fight on a more uh, permanent basis than had been uh, thought before and this is also because the Capetians within the same continent were pushing against the, uh, the the Angevin possessions, not just because they were legitimately f feeling choked by them, but also because it just was their direct, uh, their natural direction of expansion, especially in Normandy. Uh, think about the Vexan, right? The, 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 the Sand Valley, you know, the, the castles that were built there, famously enough, Chateau Gaillard by, by Richard, um, who brought there some of the most uh, advanced uh, technology um, say in, in engineering um, technologies that uh, were available at the time you know procuring uh, further developments of one century in European military engineering and also owing much to his crusading experience um, um, the the Duchy of Brittany was reorganized by Henry into eight administrative districts and it saw the introduction of Angevin legal reforms right, to feudalize further the land because at that point the feudal um, administrative practices, albeit yes, conceptually based on decentralization, were however um, still a much more effective gluing factor than the previous quasi say maybe tribal is too much but you know more primitive and more traditional um, Britonic ones. Henry also pursued an aggressive policy in Wales where since the Norman conquest continental princes had been settling quite freely as a sort of far west where they could essentially seize whatever they wanted but also with an important of course, resistance of the Welsh that eventually um, brought to a hybrid, right? As as we will see, would happen also in Ireland, etc. Um, and naturally, the same Anglo-Norman barons there had uh, taken the opportunity through their uh, decentralized position to, to autonomize themselves during the civil war. So. Henry carried out punitive campaigns against these Welsh princes, resulting in their submission to his authority. Um, and Henry avoided direct conquest. Right, it was not convenient just to um, just to spend an enormous quantity of resources to try to civilize um, these wild lands. Right, so it was just enough in order to favor also the, the further integration in the in the royal in royal power to 
use this deterrent and to say take uh, an opportunity to just harrow, in fact, to 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 raid, to plunder, and to still um, enrich thus um, the royal military revenues to, to in fact a, a a style of warfare that was somehow remunerative in in that regard um, that would pay for itself um, in that way. In this war, the Scottish King William the Lion, I made a video about medieval Scotland a couple of months ago, joined the rebellion of Henry's sons that in the meanwhile had essentially uh, began to, to oppose his father rule, so pushed by the French. And this uh, allowed Henry to um, to extract homage from the Scottish king when he was captured. And uh, in the Treaty of Falaise in 1174, uh, there was, in fact, the reaffirmation of what had historically been, in fact, the sort of clientelar nature of Scottish rulers um, towards the, the English ones. Uh, this is um, an overlooked aspect, but the, the Scotto-Norman um, culture was quite relevant, right? In the in the lowlands, um, the in, in the Scottish lowlands, the the the, the there, there had been an important Normanization, right? Sometimes even out of direct uh, military influence, that of course had also modernized so somehow the country. Of course, the the most important development of Scotland institutionally started from from the south because it was more internationally connected, more resourceful. Uh, but in this sense, in fact, more exposed to, to, to English rule. doesn't matter how decentralized, but still showing that the country was permeable. Uh, and also in this case, Henry wouldn't invade Scotland. He, uh, however, set the basis for justifying later English intervention in in the Scottish Kingdom and also uh, had himself handed over five key uh, border castles by by William which manifests the the degree of, of, of the success in the mid 12th century Ireland was substantially uh, autonomous, right? That there had never been a proper uh, invasion of by the, the English kings and the land was ruled by essentially local chieftains that were forever struggling for uh, overlordship that existed even in, in there institutionally but you know lacking the means to, to actually develop further centralization. Um, Ireland naturally was a somehow poor, isolated, um, depressed uh, region of Europe had fundu fundamentally escaped the the most important um, mm, British updates followed especially to the Norman conquest that had brought in, in fact the most advanced political, military and social uh, systems um, of Europe at that time. And um, in the 60s of the 12th century, due to this continuous quarrels among the uh, local chieftains, the King of Ireland, the Armite Mac Murcada, ruling de facto over Leinster, so one of the say forts approximately of Irish uh, lordships fundamentally, turned to Henry II for assistance in 1167 specifically. Um, this dynamic was somehow normal, let's say Ireland had always remained in contact with the, the British Isles and had international relations and we have seen it since Scottish times how even, I don't know, the Romans had from, from Britain had backed some kind of local uh, Gaelic rulers by sending troops um, in the island and trying to uh, interfere in, in, in that regard. So the mechanism was, was going on, right? Ireland had also, actually 
infested, as you know, the British coasts uh, had participated to this broader kind of northern alliance that had often opposed kind of Anglo-Saxon rebels, the Scots, um, and even the, the Norse against the established rule of, of the English kings, right? So um, at this point, uh, the, uh, the uh, England, through tr the Angevin Empire, but just also for, for the country that had become had the, the upper end, and um, Harry exploited skillfully um, uh, the Armine uh, request of help to de facto um, enter Ireland. First, he allowed the Armite to recruit mercenaries within the entire Angevin Empire, which in practice um, worked still through the the subcontracting of the eventual lands that they would have taken over in Ireland because the Armite didn't have much wealth on his own. But that's exactly the point. Um, he was like a, a fifth column in Ireland. Um, and uh, he managed, in fact, to put together an important force of Anglo-Norman and Flemish mercenaries drawn actually mostly from the Welsh marches because Wales had naturally been always kind of one of the closest lands to Ireland politically, culturally, in Britain uh, and often also come participating to these various um, uh, mercenary initiatives in different times. And this contingent included Richard de Clare, the second Earl of Pembroke, known as Strongbow, by the way. Um, and when the Armite re-entered Ireland, reclaiming Leinster, he, however, died shortly afterwards in 1171. And at that point, it was de Clare who claimed Leinster in his stead for himself. Right? At this point, Henry recognized the fact that uh, the thing had gone out of hand also because of subjects of, of his that had taken this kind of autonomous initiative, and he decided to step personally in Ireland, landing there in the same 1171 in October. There was a quite positive support coming uh, internationally uh, for Henry as um, Pope Alexander saw the opportunity to establish papal authority over the Irish Church through the um, Anglo-Norman conquest, right? Uh, Henry scored, in fact, some in initial success as uh, he managed de facto to um, uh, to have his rule accepted by both the Irish and the Anglo-Normans that had already settled um, in this frontier in southeastern Ireland practically practically however the Treaty of Windsor in 1175 proved the difficulties that Henry had in maintaining a direct control uh, as uh, in, in this pact uh, Rory O'Connor was recognized the High King of Ireland giving homage to Henry and maintaining control on his behalf. Rydri was King of Connacht previously to, to this. Um, so the, the main issue here is that as much as the Anglo-Normans could outmatch the Irish in, in open fields as they, their, because of their military technology, their tactics, their general you know, advancement, there were too few, uh, at least um, not just resources, but also s administrative systems in, in Ireland to sustain that, that, um, that same system, right? And the, the English, however, undertook an important process of encastellation that soon fundamentally brought also to many Anglo-Normans to start settling in Ireland just 
out of their own, um, especially the hungriest ones um, that had nothing to lose, their own lordships, right? And thus uh, the island was gradually taken over uh, during the centuries by sort of hegemonic English force, in spite, of course, of, again, of the difficulties that remain, especially in the peripheral, a more mountainous, uh, forested part of the island where um, direct control was mm, a mirage, right? But surely um, this is the moment in which Ireland basically gets under uh, English control and the times were mature for it. A very important part of Henry II's reign, of course, um, is occupied by his ecclesiastical policy. And mostly what would culminate with the death of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Becket, who was practically killed by Henry II's men, uh, that had probably been ordered differently, but say the situation escalated like that. Now, what was the issue? Well, um, traditionally, to make it very simple, of course, the um, Anglo-Norman monarchs had maintained on this, again, land of conquest that, that, that they considered England like, a, a very strong um, control of, of the local church. Mm -hmm. Those were the same years of the Gregorian reforms that had been going on just with the further affirmation of, of the papal monarchy um, that was definitely rising in power exactly in these years together with one of the same feudal monarchies. So there had been an increasing competition from the side, of course, of the local church that in some way had naturally pre-existed the same uh, Anglo-Norman uh, times in, in a, as a powerful uh, reality because, of course, it owned a lot of lands. It had thus lots of ecclesiastical immunities and regarded s her traditions as her own business, right? The, the main, um, the main issue regarding the, of course, there was a, a cooperation at all times, um, in in the countries between the the local rulers, the papacy, the local church, that especially backed the, also the lay political institutional developments of the kingdoms, but there were certain prerogatives that were discussed politically, specifically in this case the. Um, the uh, ex uh, the extent of royal justice on the clergy's um, crimes, right? And the, the the practice for the church was normally to defrock all those clergymen that um, stained themselves with uh, with crimes or particular gravity. And that, and in in that sense, the the monarch would feel say, uh, free at that point to to condemn these subjects as they basically were not clergy anymore to, to bring them under under royal uh, royal justice. There, there were, generally speaking, also greater problems because bishops, in theory, could not sentence to death um, and they had to recur to, um, to royal authority. But the issue between Henry II and and um, and Thomas Becket, who, by the way, had been installed by him as he had been essentially one of his most faithful friends. He was, had been a chancellor uh, in the court. He um, thus would have had to simply follow Henry's prompt. Instead, um, he he was a highly political man, and he immediately began to defend the church's prerogatives. There was exactly regarding this. Um, possibility of the kings to still judge those uh, priests uh, that had been defrocked because of terrible crimes that thus um, could uh, now be handled by secular justice. And the thing is actually m even more complicated than this, so we will make videos about this topic we've never done uh, in detail. But it's obvious that the, the whole question was much more, you know, mm, let's say, not banal, but uh, say, terms of more concrete power, and what would it mean for for these men eventually to um, to be um, still diminished in their 
in their power by uh, by the intervention of royal ju justice even after this uh, these expulsions and more because uh, the quarrel began naturally on the base of some mm, let's say interferences of, of of the crown that so fit to you know suggest what you know what, what it, in many ways that was the, the investor controversy which clergy had to be elected later because of course there was no um, pro personal property there every prelate's death there had to be an election that was by tradition to be carried out by the local church right and that the secular the, the temporal power had um, instead started regarding as a sort of prerogative so with kings saying I, I would prefer this bishop rather than this other and so on so it's a very intertwined series of, um, of of problems and this um um struggle with with Beckett lasted for essentially the the great part of the 60s of the, of the 12th century brought um, significantly to Beckett's exile in France where he was instead welcomed by Henry II's rival the Louis the seventh um also the pope naturally um was um was involved in this albeit um, that was a delicate moment for the church in which Rome uh, required internationally the English support against uh, the Holy Roman Emperor during the wars uh, with the Lombard League uh, and so on um, so the also the, the coming back of Beckett um, uh, brought to um, to an irreparable break Right, and he was he was assassinated. And telling the truth, Beckett wouldn't enjoy a great political, mm, say, appreciation at the time. But the, the local church created this cult of the, of the martyr, for which, of course, Beckett I is a saint. Um, and uh, Henry would also, at some point in his um, political strains, um, try to stick to that kind of uh, kind of repented. Uh, monarch who had killed unjustly the the the, the priest, and um, um, you know sh appealing to some of the kind of the local spirit, saying, "Ah, oh, he's truly repented, so let's support him in his wars against his rebellious sons." And there was, of course, it was not much the people; it was the same church, right? But for telling you how powerful, of course, these institutions really were. Um, an important mention deserved the. Constitutions of Clarendon, issued by Henry in 1164, that essentially attempted to restrict ecclesiastical privileges and the extent of papal um, interference in in England. Right then, things would um, change during the course of the of of Henry's reign for contingent political reasons. But it was an important step for the definition of um, the royal and ecclesiastical prerogatives in the country and would remain as the base of further um, elaborations. And um, the main issues, in fact, in, in Henry's reign derived, as we've seen, f from their son's revolt, right? Um, Henry had planned um, some some inheritance splits that would contain his son's powers until he was alive and it was in particular the attempt to give his landless still landless according to this inheritance plan youngest son john who seemingly also was his his favorite one even though still um the the dynastic succession uh, remained also by Henry's will, of course, the primogeniture one. A wedding gift of three castles prompted the eldest sons and wife, Eleanor, uh, who sided with them, in fact, to rebel in the revolt of 1173 1174. The reason why Eleanor uh, uh, mm, opposed uh, her husband mm, mm, is not entirely clear. Sources say that their relationship had degenerated over the years, and probably 
over the policy um, towards the, the county of Toulouse um, that um, Henry had somehow favored uh, at the detriment of some Aquitanian uh, some Aquitanian possessions of which Eleanor uh, that came from the region re re resented um, in that um, there are complicated games that had to do with said properly the bi the balance of b between Capetian and Andrewan power uh, in France, uh, which are extremely complicated. Again, today we cannot just descend in, in the details of this, but there was a relentless struggle, wars, um, agreements, um, say cons concessions that even when say giving something to to the rival was just by claiming the fact that you would dispose of say of that thief would claim that it was yours and so if the other had accepted by getting it but still was kind of accepting your own overlordship so um and they would do it back and forth like because the capetians naturally were the kings uh, of france and thus the the overlords of all the the Andrewan possessions um in in france in the kingdom as such uh, and um, henry would play at some point even as if he was the one who held the, this territories instead in this in this sense of homage acceptance in, in his own personal power so that that's the kind of of background which is the reason also why louis the seventh that had been humiliated by his uh wife's divorce and andrew and pressure and the fact that she had borne him but essentially females and thus not a, a uh, a male hair uh, that he would get after uh, and with important consequences given that Philip II would crush the, uh, the Angevin Empire uh, for good um, was humiliated of course by the, the, the fact that Eleanor had eventually married Henry II who had had multiple male hairs and so there was this kind of proximity for which in fact the same uh, sons sided at a point with uh, their father's uh, rival and also because again the, the opportunity as French subject was, was also quite 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 great there were important marriages and um, dowries possessions compromises and so on um, and these wars are very complicated because they were brought to England herself so uh, there was a further cycle of devastations and this as we were saying before uh, was a no win for essentially anyone because they would have or all reigned at some point and so um was however it's however meaningful to, to show how um complicated the stability of the same possessions was right? so that at some point it was even better to, to fight before not to have to cope with greater problems later it is in this context of 18 months of war that Henry was able to force the rebels to submit to his authority mm -hmm. in Le Mans in 1182 he gathered his sons to plan for partible inheritance which his eldest son, which was Henry, um, the, the younger king so-called, would inherit England, Normandy and Anjou, Richard, the Duchy of Aquitaine, where he in fact would spend most of his life, right, even though he was uh, adult life, he was raised in, in England. Geoffrey was another son that, however, wouldn't rank his diet uh, during um, during uh, th this uh, this events, uh, Brittany and John would receive Ireland, mm -hmm. and the order was uh, again the primogenitor one. And all all these children was uh, were, were able commanders by the way. They all knew how to play their cards very well. But as you understand, uh, this whole you know effort that Henry the Second had incarnated himself as a ruler to bring the country together after devastating decades of, of civil war etc now was being um, torn apart once again by these events and war broke out again 
right? Uh, at this point, the younger Henry um, waged war against his father, but died of dysentery. While um, his other sons had been sent to, to fight him, uh, Geoffrey died in 1186 um, as a result of a tournament accident, uh, which at the time was rather a frequent eventuality given that tournaments were just uh, a re real battles right without any other regulation but the ones that existed normally in allegedly chivalrous warfare um, so in part this was weakening the same Henry's position because the risk that all children would die at some point as it had happened in the dynasty before as uh, with with the lack of hairs and further wars break out in the process was was a concrete risk but at the same time this allowed for somehow greater compaction right and the the, the creation of rivalry between just less parties um, in 1189 it was Richard that at this point was the next uh, uh, presumptive heir and Philip II of France mm, took advantage of a sickening Henry II with more success um, and Henry II's mm, efforts were really relentless gigantic uh, he had showed to be able single-handedly to, to tame all his children successfully but just the system was so big this this Angevin Empire so complex that that required a constant fight and in fact he um, came to a full capitulation while he was dying of a bleeding ulcer but with no greatly practical consequences for for the Empire itself because um, even though the war was against him personally it was just for his son essentially to, to become king next so the same political territorial issues would have been faced in fact by the English um, uh, kings still let's call it in, in, in this way and 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 the French ones want to draw this boundary right and at this point by the way um, there was already a rivalry between Richard and John because the latter that they had cooperated at different times um, but at some point John had also sided with with his father and just uh, uh, seemingly was uh, at this last moment uh, when the the French had also managed to 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 essentially push the 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 Anglo Normans um, uh, to to a corner that uh, Henry died uh, just out of the of pain of, by knowing that his favorite son John had finally also abandoned him. Um, so it was just nothing but the humiliation of a dying man uh, in this regard. And Henry's fame, however, it has been long-lasting, right? It's considered, famously enough, one of the greatest English rulers. Um, historiographically, there have been questions regarding, again, mostly this nationalistic issues, like at some point, I don't know, the, the British historiography said this was an English king and the French were opposed to them, but saying the last decades, uh, national historiographers came a bit more together in assessing what he carried out, especially as a French king in in, in France, right? I mean, a, a king of England, but still being a French uh, man uh, him, himself, um, and ruling a country where there was a French king, um, and in fact considered that there was. Uh, as we were saying before, an important share of different institutional administrative practices, a great modern modernizing of the system. Um, and um, definitely there are, all these Angevin kings were also accused of having some darker traits, especially uh, m an important cruelty, right, and harshness. But if you look at it in perspective, having to fight throughout all their lives to maintain something that a approached more like an empire than a, than a kingdom, um, being constantly betrayed, they, they needed to maintain kind of a sort of face of um, also of mm, superiority compared to a normal normal human, right? And thus 
punishing also very harshly uh, his uh, their rivals and so on. Henry, so seemingly particularly educated, was particularly energetic, and considering the settlements with his sons having managed to defeat them, you can consider him to have been also somehow, you know, generous to have given a chance again to his heirs to not going so harsh as he c could, like evidently also with somebody who was not his sons. So I'm making everything extremely simple here, it's just like an introductory video. And passing to Richard that here had been um, negotiating with his father in the last moments of his life and that list anecdotes say he never fully reconciled with but it's it's debatable according to me they they quite concretely understood each other um, allegedly John was Eleanor's favorite instead so there was some sort of there were many legions about Richard himself they claimed some sort of of um, almost demonic nature right according to the again the Uranian Ketonic dichotomy of, of the times, right? His military exploits for which he became famous were apparently connected also with this kind of wilder, in fact, leonine uh, temper, spirit. And that's the, the thing, of course, for which Richard passed down to history the most, like the great commander, the great um, chivalrous knight, this great, um, greatly competent warrior, uh, and at, at the same time, he was, I think, literally the English king who stayed at the least in England, uh, at least as a ruler, something like six months. He spent most of his uh, reign in Aquitaine or, and or ab abroad uh, during, uh, during the Crusade. And so we can also measure his political talents less right especially in this kind of more uh, from the profile of more structured policy right of recompaction power especially from England and the, the, the quite bulky thing that was starting to become also probably from a governmental bureaucratic point of view that instead we can appreciate more with John or or their father uh, for that matter because um, say participating to the crusade was a great um, course a great plus in the world of, of the time it would provide you first of all this is often overlooked with some immunities within the same local political context for example the same John that wouldn't go to the crusade but during the rebellions against him declared that it was about to so that he would acquire kind of greater papal protection and a sort of more revered status at that point um, said Richard was planning this f from a while and uh, he um, he skipped uh, thus most of you know of at least for, for what he would have done if he had stayed the uh, kind of local administrative nuisances. Uh, on the day of Richard's English coronation there was a mass slaughter of the Jews um, in, in London that uh, essentially started from some royal prompt of say at least in reducing some Jewish prerogatives that instead mm, triggered uh, literally a popular revolt in which lots of Jews were killed expelled but also you know Christian buildings were set on fire by the same mob and so um, brought to this important destabilization that worried Richard who also was quite severe he had uh, the um, the responsible killed and also many Jews were were brought back because you know he would maintain of course his religion uh, their religious uh, liberties um, but again his mind was already on, on the crusade and he had to gather naturally a lot of a lot of resources prior to this uh, he left for the for the Levant in early 1190 and the journey was pretty strained this was the third crusade right that um, 
was a so-so one. At least the second one had been a disaster, the first one had been successful. The third one owes part of its, let's say, its partial success also to Richard's uh, intervention. Given that he was the, 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 the greatest commander involved, in fact, the one that took over control of, of the crusading forces after after the the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa died in, in, in Anatolia before even reaching the Holy Land. But in order to reach this, Richard had to um, first of all re um, uh, reach Sicily by sea because the English uh, essentially took the Atlantic route and then the Mediterranean one, whereas others, say the Germans, had taken the still the continental, the Danubian one. And when he was in Sicily, he came in conflict with the Count of Lecce, Tancred I, over the rights of Richard's sister, the widow queen of Sicily, uh, Jeanne, right? Uh, that had remained uh, unprotected from the secular Norman barons that were always eager to kind of undermine um, the crown uh, following the death of William the second King William the second Richard um, as a consequence stormed and sacked the city of Messina that had opposed to him and that was essentially the Western Mediterranean's gateway to the Holy Land with her port uh, controlling the Straits um, and so on uh, this first of all shows kind of the temper of, of Richard that had already displayed in France extraordinary um, polyarsetic capacities. Like this, this is, as we were saying before, to together with Chateau Gaillard, but also the impressive firepower he um, managed to, to deploy through quite advanced um, stone-throwing engines that he had uh, perfectioned himself during, um, during the campaign. Uh, the, the nickname Lionheart, not because of the siege engines, but let's say for the courage that he displayed during these assaults that required an important uh, support bombardment um, with, in fact, military engineering at the time being ever more demanding. The Angevin kings were some of the earliest dynasts in Europe to invest um, specifically in trained bodies of military engineers uh, um, also, naval engineers for that matter, especially under John, right? Not even under uh, under Richard, who had himself uh, a great um, understanding of how to storm castles, but also how to build them, which of course is um, the the two phases of the same of the same metal. Um, and um, this the, the capture of Messina on October the fourth, eleven ninety, brought fundamentally to the peace agreement with Tancred as well, who at that point couldn't couldn't do that much because the connection with the Sicilian uh, possessions there was was cut. Right, so given that he was trying to usurp power from mostly the southern Italian um, power base seizing the straits there by um, the lion herd was exactly the, the right political and strategical move for, for compromise. At this point Richard could sail to the Holy Land but he had to make a first stop in Cyprus because essentially his fleet was shipwrecked. His sister and his fiance Berengaria along with several other ships including the treasure one were seized in Cyprus by the local despot Isaac Comnenus and as a consequence given that Richard first asked to be given back everything you know including you know the, the would-be wife his sister the treasure he simply stormed the island right again so that's uh, a very effective way of solving problems and this is also in fact the history of uh, of Latin Cyprus uh, as 
essentially the island became a western feudal and Christian base in, in the Mediterranean that could support uh, operations uh, later also when the Holy Land was lost. I made a video about the Cypriot uh, army and navy organization in, in the late Middle Ages. But uh, eventually the Lusignan, as you know, would, that were already there together with Richard would take control of the island, right? Um, feudally. Even though Richard passes for the chivalrous hero of, of the situation, he also had quite a temper. He rejected and humiliated the King of France's sister. He insulted and refused the spoils of the Third Crusades to nobles like Leopold V, Duke of Austria. And he was rumored to have arranged the assassination of Conrad of Montferrat. Um, so all these events have a context, but there is no doubt that the Lionheart had also quite of a, you know, kind of cold, mm, say, temper wherever he could, he could uh, regarding uh, understanding others' points. Of course, there was a a political sense of um, of this all. For example, in the case of Leopold V, um, this was after the death of Barbarossa, the leader of the Germans, and when the Crusaders stormed Acre, which was one of the successes of also of, of Richard, in this context, the banner of the King of France, the one of the King of England, and the one of the Duke of Austria in this case was raised at the same level and Richard notoriously took the Austrian banner and threw it in the in the mud slash the sewer of, of Acre um, and that would be paid back as as you know he was captured by Leopold um, on his return journey in 1192 while he was in Vienna uh, say uh, in in disguise right as a as a temple was recognized apparently by by a ring but the the behavior there even during the german prisony towards uh, the emperor was I, i'm of the of, of a rank that does not know any other superior but god right so i made a video um last year if i'm not wrong about the holy roman imperial ideology and there, there was a space dedicated not specifically to this event but to what was the general f feeling abroad also regarding you know why the germans should have monopolized the imperial title and especially the english even though they were often allied with them for contingent international reasons really you know were quite insensitive to imperial uh, overlordship um in in england um and so you understand there probably an, a very overlooked aspect of like what it could be properly a Norman uh, Angevin mentality at that point. Like, you know, these were the descendants of William the Conqueror. They probably saw themselves as really above anyone else, as their lifestyle as knights was spent, in fact, their entire existence on horseback at war uh, was was a testament to that right these were people who had pride superiority and violence as, as a raison d'etre they considered you know the, the peasantry like non-human beings they, they were totally projected in a celestial dimension in a much closer way to, to tradition than, than we think because that's also basically all they knew right their entire lifestyle was based on this and just think about being literally the, the head of the Angevin Empire actually in, in especially in that context um, is the answer to to the, uh, to the to the German ruler was something more connected with the the actual shame that the prisony brought on Richard who had himself crowned a second time when he managed to go get back to England as also because as you know the ransom there was huge uh, something like 150,000 marks that his mother in 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 Aquitaine had to to gather from from everywhere right that was for actually the entire Angevin domains making the church pay confiscating goods so 
that was a massive blow, right? The Richard became the, the credit card of, you know, the, you know, his um, kidnappers. And um, this, um, this cruel, some people say, well, he also exterminated 2,500 Muslim prisoners in Acre because he had to march to Jerusalem. And uh, basically both Leopold of Austria after that scene had bailed out of the crusade. So the king of France did so he found himself with all the prisoners of these people in Acre and having to get to a march that was hellish, as we will see. And logistically, uh, all these, these men were useless. So he thought better to massacre them, right? He could have liberated them in a way, but evidently they also had some value in that regard. So, yes, for us it seems definitely like just a, a serial killer, but definitely that's what those people I mean you cannot be a medieval knight if you are not trained to rip a, you know a human being apart in the blink of an eye right that's what they were exclusively trained for because their entire military performance was their political power so uh, this was kind of a more probably rationalized choice because um, Richard was clever, um, but it's also obvious that uh, in terms of what we would define today as human sensitivity, well, he was very different from the average person today. Well, there is no doubt about this. That's the reason why there is this kind of, in my opinion, uh, wrong historiographical shadow on him. Even his sexuality has been kind of debated just for, for the worst, like he passes for an homosexual, but if you actually look at the sources, you can't, you can't say that, right? The only reason why, because he eventually had to send back his uh, wife. He, he wouldn't um, see her for a long time. Um, she also had huge problems to come back to England for all that mess that, that had happened in the meanwhile. He actually expressed regrets for that because he was not like a, you know, uh, he was a gentleman for, for the standards of that time. Um, he said he... he slept with uh, uh, with Philip Augustus uh, but that was something it was done at the time I mean, even Charles the fifth and Francis the first slept like as brothers let's say once but they were it's, it's as if today you you take like a photo together when there is an international um, meeting right uh, it doesn't mean like an homosexual tendency uh, and I don't see the but let's say for for this reason, maybe perhaps because he also failed by some degree in, in during the, the the crusade. Um, he, for example, came very close to Jerusalem, um, and the the weather was unusually cold. There were there was there was an ail storm, um, and Jerusalem probably would have fallen if the 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 crusader army had just appeared in front of of the of the city. Um, but uh, Richard decided given the logistical situation to come back, that was probably a mistake, a very important one, because imagine just w if the lion herd had managed to conquer Jerusalem. So eventually he died, also in the infamous way, as you know, um, at the siege of a, practically of an insignificant for fortification, the Chateau de Chaloux, Chabrol, that seemingly had attracted uh, his attention during the campaign that he undertook when he came back to France. Because uh, there was a, allegedly maybe a, a, a Roman gold treasure buried there that he wanted to, to get. And the stories vary. Also, he was shot by a crossbow bolt by a kid um, that he forgave because he, he got gangrene and died of that, reached by his mother later. Uh, forgave the, the kid that was eventually quartered, actually alive after uh, his death by the local by Mercader, one of the, this kind of mercenary figures that uh, began professionally and permanently to appear as sort of um, mercenary company leaders at this time. Uh, and so there is this kind of bitter, meager, cold, um, almost uh, ruvid picture of Richard. But this is just like, like what happened. Did you know him personally? Right? According to me, he was kind of a very interesting figure. First of all, he, was, he also appeared as good-looking. He probably had a sense of himself that regard because he was tall, 
well-built fair. Uh, he had uh, red light um, uh, hair, um, bl uh, blue eyes, and so on. And he he passed as a champion of beauty. You see, for for a Western knight, physical beauty was a moral value of superiority because they cared about the race at stock. For example, John wasn't like that. He was like 165 centimeters tall. He was kind of had barrel chested he had um dark red hair um but uh so let's say the lion heart remained as more like in in the myth of his knightly actions and then in in the rather misery of his prison at the castle of durnstein on the danube under leopold and um, so in this enormous embarrassment that also the necessity of the ransom brought uh in, in the moment in which his brother John was taking advantage of his absence in Britain. Uh, the French were also starting to pressure um, his possessions. Literally, imagine having that enormous power, all the mess that could happen, and just living for the crusade and having to live with that. Like, it's, it's just, you know, uh, just going out for vacations and forgetting if you, if you switch <laughs> the gas off right you know at home like it's those kind of uh, like how could they bear all this weight and all this bird and surely there was a great quality there but exactly because of his precocious in 1199 and the general collapse of the Angevin empire uh, a couple of decades uh, from then um has made him this kind of almost romantic figure frankly and um and as a military historian, I can say that, yes, his feats in the Third Crusade were really, really impressive. The Battle of Arsuf, right, all these battles were fought uh, against Saladin, right, after, as you know, the Third Crusade was triggered by the, the conquest of Jerusalem. I made a video about the um, Battle of the Horns of Athen, where the Jerusalemitan army was, was annihilated and Jerusalem captured after a short siege. Um, uh, ultimately, as we've seen, the, the crusade failed because of the death of Barbarossa, the, considering his military uh, capacities, also chiefly his personal energy, surely would have achieved great things had he survived the crossing. Uh, Richard was quite successful. Arsuf uh, is remembered one of the most important battles of the High Middle Ages. I mean, the 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 cold nerves that you must have while you're under the you know the fire of this enormous multitude of harassing multitude of of Egyptian horsemen and you have to hold the line for spotting the right moment to charge and the tactics that he um, carried out together with the um, an Italian crossbowmen and um, competing with also the the Templars that as you know charged on the right wing and there was this thing this competition among the various knights to say who would charge first the other would be a coward right and so uh, when the Templars did charge he ordered a full charge and basically routed the enemy army it wasn't annihilated telling the truth it was a sort of ambush um, so the the Crusaders options were somehow limited at it, but it was handled masterfully skillfully would combine arms knights and crossbowmen um successfully halting the the muslim cavalry um the the victory of jaffa is also important uh the, the well okay the same storming of acre right and you see also what's the, the reputation that he earned he earned in, in france um so yeah he was the typical knight of the time he composed in old french in old occitan uh, also when he was prisoner at Dürnstein, um, and he he just embodies a bit the life of the time, just like with other great figures like William uh, Longepe, like William the Marshal, uh, considered, you know, at least in this ideal, that the greatest knight of his times. Um, so these were dynasts of war, not just men of war. Th these were rulers that, as, we, as you have seen, were just as very young already inclined to this kind of power struggle and um, military uh, quasi exhibitionism fundamentally and and necessity to prove their value as they believed they were essentially a chosen stock 
right of conquerors and the fact that they, they lead and, and behave as such. Um, and again, I feel sorry just to skip Henry II and uh, Richard the first with this few words, but um, say again, it's just an introduction. And I would like, especially, in fact, to instead concentrate on John because I think that he is the, uh, the 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 one of the most misunderstood monarchs in in the history, not just of the English crown, but in general, like of the Middle Ages specifically. Like you know, when you're a kid, there is the the cartoon with uh, you know. Uh, John Lackland, that is the evil king that is so greedy and Robin Hood goes to... I, I, I already at the time I had problems with Robin Hood's kind of lawfulness and quasi-communism in, in some fashion. But aside from this, um, having, say, not actually, as you know, not, not, a, not an expertise on medieval England specifically, nor on John specifically, either, I dramatically came to reconsider the man, right? There is no doubt that John brought to the end of, of the empire such because he lost France and he had to accept papal vassalage and all lots of things that, yes, sound particularly bad considering what the empire was before. But there is naturally a context and there is also a ruler here, right? Um, ruling these countries hadn't become easier than before at all, right? So the you you can be a lion herd and going around uh, the world um, massacring Saracens and you know uh, becoming famous for your great knightly feats. Um, but uh, that's something that in theory any knight can do. What about managing such a huge empire and trying to keep it together and also in the meanwhile um, developing the means to find the resources to to take out your main um, your main and in fact mortal enemy, right? That, that is the Capetian dynasty, which is essentially trying to to expel you from France um, with ever more powerful means and a very cohesive um, ideology, etc. Consider that the Capetians, in in this regard, were much more politically obedient. You don't you don't have there all this mess that happens during the Norman Angevin times um, with the um, children rebelling and so on. Um, th this is an important aspect of the world. You, you, I wouldn't digress on, on this particular aspect if not for not considering the role of John, right, as the youngest son. So the one that was also more unlikely to get anything, hence uh, Lackland, which wasn't quite a definitive statement. It just Henry II that. Uh, uh, joked about him because in this broader partition he still nobody had decided what John would get given that there would have been other let's say his eldest brothers first in line and it w was already a big deal if you know there could be a peaceful succession which as we've seen wouldn't even exist in fact with, with, to, to his father um, he actually would get land Ireland specifically Yes, the lamest <laughs> of all the the the, the Angevin Empire, but um, even there, on the long run, for, say there are many aspects that of of John's reign that actually prove an important capacity and um, incompetence. In spite of there is also luck in many ways. You you cannot achieve anything great without luck, but luck is exactly the fact that it the thing has nothing to do with your ability per se or apparently so um, I don't know John as you know was not at Bouvines when Philip II crushed the Anglo Germans and thus destroyed basically the, the wiped out the entire uh, except for for the southwest France of Angevin domination because uh, Battles like that, even if it wasn't a huge one, numerically also speaking, but at the beginning of the 13th century, relatively archaic times still, it was an enormous cost, right, for, for these entire systems. And, and John had invested some of the finest qualities in that endeavor. And both, say, tactically he couldn't lead that thing, but you can maybe see some differences 
maybe uh, there, there were mostly English mercenaries in that battle. Also, very few Germans, because nobody, or just the Lotharingians, sided with Otto the Fort. But he had already lost his battle in Germany. Arguably, I made a video about him, um, the uh, the demise of Philip of Swabia and the rise of Otto of Brunswick. Um, Bouvines is a momentous uh, event in. Um, in fact, in European history, it, it's arguably the battle that had like the the greatest impact politically in uh, in at that point high medieval Europe. At least the fates of France, England, Germany, and Italy were decided at that very moment. Uh, we will talk about it later. So uh, that's the scale of the gamble, right? Had just the the English won at Bouvin, uh, we would be talking about John as the greatest king ever, etc. So you you don't have to be emotionally influenced by the outcome, right? You have to stay sharp about the actual king's capacities, even in moment of enormous difficulty and in the moments of failure and what he could lose further and he wouldn't, right? Um, consider at this point Richard had um, failed to provide a heir, right? So it was a succession crisis. And Drew, Brittany, Maine, and Turin chose Richard's nephew, that was the uh, the son of Geoffrey, and nominated heir Arthur, while John succeeded in England and Normandy. And at this point already, again, it's a, it's a biological accident. Right, there was this kid, which um, uh, wouldn't actually live uh, much uh, longer, but immediately Philip of France, that again had um, been at, at the, this point at the head of one of the, the most of, of the strongest for em emerging forces in Europe, and that was that, uh, of course, closely connected with, with the Angevin domains as well, took the opportunity to destabilize the Angevin territories on the European mainland further. And so, of course, he supported his vassal Arthur's claim to the English crown, even though by Norman law, Richard was the actual favorite, because he was still seen as the brother, right? It was a, a something that the Normans had maintained as opposed to primogeniture sometimes. It's not just that descended lineage, but, you know, brothers have to rule one after the other, and then maybe after the heirs, right? At least there was this. Uh, Richard was um, a man at that point. He had been competently uh, involved from a political military point of view. Uh, he had known when to gain his father's favor during the, the civil wars. Then he had, you know, supported um, Richard, right? During uh, his brother's reign, he had actually tried to usurp um, uh, his, um, not, not the crown per se, but mostly he had taken power over directly and he had to struggle against Richard's, um, uh, say, appointees and managing to, to seize an important amount of control um, he had originally been invested by his father with the control of Ireland. At least his first expedition there was unsuccessful. He eventually also blamed others for that. But as we've seen, Ireland was just like a bit like the, the Vietnam of, of the situation. So let, let's be careful about this. Um, when Arthur's forces threatened Eleanor of, of, of Aquitaine, that had um, preferred Richard, but now was siding with John as well. John won a significant victory as he captured the entire rebel le leadership at the Battle of Mirabeau, which already is um, a pretty significant uh, success. He crossed Norm Normandy, men, uh, Anjou, so he reaffirmed an important um, you know, also political and strategic capacity by 
successfully smashing the Lusignan army by surprise, by the way, in, in the process. So he proved to be skillful um, also as a commander. Arthur was murdered, right? And it was rumored by John's own hands. There is this, again, kind of uh, mythology of cruelty revolving uh, specifically around John. But again, when you look at what also his brothers, his father did, like you can't say, first of all, m most of these information are n no better than voices, right? Um, that historiography elaborated on it. Unfortunately, also with a bias and so on. So again, John has to pass with the, the, as the sick, twisted fuck who you know was just evil and cruel. Um, there is much, actually, more to that. Also in the in the actual, mm, you know, uh, insulting ways he he behaved sometimes, especially against the barons initially. That actually went in favor of the of of the monarchy per se which again was not like a bad thing the bad thing would occur when is that the barons managed to win in practice um this is a bit like you know the the bias existing in flavian times against the julio colodi just because eventually the latter had um, not just won but they they had somehow received the support of the the this more of the senatorial establishment that hated that kind of more monarchic orientation that was also the most successful one this is a, a bit similar Right, the fact that also his sexual life was uh, criticized because he slept um, with um, with married women of the nobility. Right, all, all these kings had full of uh, mistresses at court um, all the time, but this specific relationships with the wives of of, of noblemen uh, was a way to say, look, that if I want as a king, I can do it. Because I am the king, right? And we don't even know about the nature of these relationships. It's not that we know the sentimental details of whether, you know, maybe at some point he may have been, surely at some point not, but what we know, they, have, they even fell in love. There was a specific reason why the women would also betray their husbands. This is not the point. The point is political, right? Is also showing there the, the, the measure of confidence and, and power. Henry II had probably spotted that in him because because John was definitely a very cold calculating figure right um, the, the worst things have been told a bit for the same reason to one of his greatest contemporaries Frederick the second of Orange South and they were actually similar individuals characterly um, and uh, also Fre Frederick passes for kind of some um, even impious ruler but why because the, the word bad voices against him, but there is no proof of any kind that, for example, as has been said for John, he had some contempt towards um, religion, per se, right? We know how much he spent for the, uh, for the regular uh, Christian ceremonies um, in, uh, at court, in the, you know, in, in the, in the, in the cyclical festivals, and so the, the it's perfectly in tune with the uh, an average pious king of his times. His wife was much younger than him. They married when she was uh, 15, which was somehow young for actually the times. Um, but this caused rumors of criticism, mostly in the later historiography. And when you look at them, they actually um, made five children. And there wasn't kind of anything suggesting that was kind of a... I don't know, it was seen negatively for some reason. Why? Right? It was a successful relationship for the time standards, also considering what essentially a, 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 um, a king and a queen had to do for, for uh, ensuring um, a succession, which would, did happen, by the way, because Henry III was their, uh, their son, succeeding uh, later, being also one of the most um, continuous rulers in English history, chronologically. Um, so again, the idea that it was somehow evil, cruel, contemptuous, um, the fact he had also different political faces with the various parts of the Angevin Empire, well, it, it's kind of obvious, right? Again, it's very similar to w what Frederick II did. You know, he had a different face for the various peoples, countries, cultures that he coped with, right? You don't cope the same way you cope with an Irish 
the way you cope with a Norman or a an Aquitanian word in English. It, it, it's all different, right? And it reveals actually um, an important skill, right? Not a political schizophrenia as, being de as it's been defined historiographically. And again, we don't find, aside from these offenses to, to the noblemen, any specific reason to say, okay, this what what it was particularly evil compared to what others were doing. Um, uh, he carried out some interesting administrative reforms. Um, he began, he introduced new taxes, of course, for which is famous also in the story, in the folklore, right? Um, and when you look at the fact that he was paying for uh, more advanced armies that had to cope with the Capetian ones, and look also at the strategic success that many of his operations had, um, and also, you know, at the scale and the ambition and the quasi success of the ones that also failed, especially in France, especially the Spencer movement, f uh, with an important support of f uh, fleet that he he paid, um, uh, and uh, also prevented a French invasion of England. True, by the way, introducing also important naval technologies, some tower decks. Um, like you realize, this this man knew what he was doing, right? He wasn't, an in by any stretch of the imagination, an incompetent one. The taxes were mostly um, imposed also due to significant um, strains due to, mm, say, natural causes, apparently, of famine, etc. This brought to an economical crisis which was made worse, indeed, by the fact that um, John had extended an important control on the uh, precious metals of the realm. He had, uh, s mm, say, securely guarded them. He stored these barrels filled, especially in silver, in, in the main castles that had been built throughout his father's times. And he also implemented to, in fact, uh, maintain firm control of the country, like his his um, also his uh, brother. Richard had done. He had endowed him with an important amount of lands in western England, but he had retained as a king the control um, of, of the local fortresses to uh, prevent uh, John getting too much power. Well, John eventually did the same thing, and by preserving this silver as an important, um, you know, mean of so royal policy um, and local control, surely there was an um, an important inflation on the market that he eventually um, started to fix himself uh, towards the end of his reign uh, by re-injecting, let's say, silver uh, in, in the currency, become, making it become much stronger. Um, so a series of coincidences, but also of needs to strengthen power and to be able especially to have a military instrument adequate to cope with the main threats of uh, to especially the French possessions. In Ireland, he was successful from a royal perspective because no major, mm, say, um, headway was made, uh, like in a broader kind of English sense, but he managed, given that the guerrilla of the Irish, w the Irish was raging against the Anglo-Normans, to exploit both sides' failures to aggrandize his own power as a king. Um, he um, issued some laws that would uh, say essentially make him able to confiscate the baronial lands if they refused or wouldn't be able to pay uh, the new taxes which by political stand some barons in fact uh, opposed themselves to and he found out that he could cash more by confiscating these guys lands in the process that of course con did contribute to the um, to the discontent, but again, if you look at the political geography of it, most of the discontent was concentrated in the north. So in the lands that had actually always been since also his father, say, the, the, the civil war that after which his father had emerged um, um, king, in, in, the, in the least integrated parts of the kingdoms, the ones that often sided also with Scotland, um, that uh, would take any chance to autonomize themselves at the detriment of the kingdom's unity. Um, and it's obvious that he also favored those barons that were loyal to the crown, as opposed to those that instead 
opposed it. So he would close an eye even regarding these confiscations for those who supported him. But that's also a way to co-opt um, power, right? To essentially rely on noblemen that can be provided with eventually with also part of the wealth um, in a more unitary sense from the, the rebellious ones. So all in all, yes, these were very unprejudiced and um, um, somehow shrewd and cold and calculated moves, um, unfair ones if you want, but if you look at it from, again, the, the sake of the stability of the monarchy and of, of the kingdom there and still the fact that these, that these that monarchic resources were used to try to, to counter the enemy threat, especially in France, you, you'd see that there is a point. Consider that Arthur's sister, Eleanor, that had been captured after the Battle of Mirabeau was kept by John in captivity for the rest of her life. That's also very cruel. There is no doubt about that. But from a dynasty, again, that comes from constant civil wars due to this heirs, to whoever could marry Eleanor and claim at that point uh, the, the inheritance. It's just like the same Angevins had come to power with, with Matilda, you know. So, again, brutal as much as you like, but from John's perspective, this was rather saying, okay, let's simply eliminate the problem, right? He, even if he had taken out Arthur, we know what, what's the point, right? This is no different from other uh, incredibly cold and cynical political actions in history that, however, were aimed at preserving power and avoiding further disruptive civil wars, because England could not afford it in the broader international situation of the time. Um, there is no doubt that many um, French barons began to side with Philip II. Right? There was there a broader point connected with the fact that France was becoming ever more powerful as a monarchy and the great feudatories were being co-opted in the same way so there was more to share and England had been a difficulty exactly because of this terrible costs of the wars of um, Richard's um, uh, ransom etc so th those are not light blows as we were saying in the previous video the the shipwreck of uh, of, of Henry the first and the death of his son there ruined one of the single most centralizing potential in Europe by far right so all those resources could have been invested differently and maybe the Angevins could have even made it later to turn okay in that sense it would have not been the Angevins but still the, the Anglo-Normans would have managed to turn the tides against the Capetians who knows um, in any case John was working that um, in direction of, of stemming, right, of creating a dam against this un unchecked uh, expansion. Um, this brought to a revolt in 1202 that, uh, in fact, had the Norman and Angevin territories lost. But th the situation was not lost yet, because as you know, there would be the, the major attempt in 1214 to recover the entire French possession was about to succeed, as a matter of fact. So consider it even in potential. Yes, he lost it, but he was a one step away from successfully retaking them. And putting France at risk of collapsing, literally, in turn. So it was either them or... Or, or the others, right? <laughs> there, there was no um, other way. H uh, John's son, Henry III, would maintain claim uh, of on this uh, continental territories until 1259. Mm -hmm. um, John managed to restore his authority in England after all these initial opposition, so showing that his power there was solid, and this is an important step for the further anglicization of power that had, at this point, started to seem the most convenient uh, choice for for the crown. Th this, this aspect is interesting because, as we've seen, Richard was instead more like of an Aquitanian. Um, 
John was somehow more British oriented given just the background that his father had let him operate in um, in his youth and um, it seemed evident that the, the, the French possessions were were important but they were more sparse, more politically fragmented. This is somehow also overlooked in the evaluation of especially the, the 1202 um, loss of even of Normandy, so the ancestral land of the uh, of the Anglo Norman Angevin uh, dynasty. Um, you can see it simply from a map, right? All those territories would be taken over by 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 the Capetians. But one reason why this was possible is that they were also starting to becoming peripheral, right? There had not been properly a further successful centralization level over time in all these various Normandy, Maine, Anjou, Aquitaine. They were rich uh, countries in Europe, right? But they were also separated from one another. They had their own traditions. They, they were also quite distant in, in practice. Consider it even from a strictly geographical point of view. I mean, Ga places like Gascony as opposed to to Ireland, like it, it's complicated to, to keep them all together. Um, and thus, um, it was a loss of an important amount of land, but not necessarily a qualitative amount of land. This doesn't make too much difference in practice. I, 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 it's an absolute loss that you cannot uh, relativize. But at the same time, the focus on England may have been still the most sensible choice, right, from an historical point of view. I, it's a very long-term concept in a way, but at least in the directions that were taken at the time, you realize that John would fight for the French territories, but had definitely his uh, unavoidable power base, and for good at that point in English history, in England. So this 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 is this was his choice, right? Differently, just uniquely from his brothers. Mm -hmm. um, so what occurred in 1214, I explained in multiple videos, there was a pincer movement that was carried out um, against the northeast and the west of France that was uh, seemingly John's favorite strategy for which he had developed his fleet, for which he had averted also um, French invasion. Actually, would the French invasion would happen, but s still because there had been a, a storm that had destroyed the English fleet. Right, so can you blame... Uh, John Ford, well, of course, God decided that. Let's not forget that, and it's a pow quite powerful thing. But at the same time, right, uh, lots of unpredicted, uh, unpredictable factors. Um, and this strategy was actually good, too. Um, and it entailed the alliance with Otto IV, Holy Roman Emperor, that at that point was excommunicated by the Pope. And through this alliance, um, John Shirley was trying to increase power further uh, monarchic power on, on the Church of England right at this point consider that the, p the papacy is at its acme right Roman Catholicism at this point has e almost every Western country in Europe as his vassal and John still maintains that um, Norman tradition of considering the English Church something that the, the, the papacy had also compromised, as we've seen uh, in, in this last two videos at some point, uh, for practical reasons, to reinforce further, however, in the conviction of, of the local kings. Um, Otto had also been an unprejudiced ruler. He, he was definitely one that screwed up the most. I mean, he definitely carried out a sensible policy, but he really was too impertinent from an international point of view. As you know, he had received the imperial crown in exchange for the promise of not reuniting Germany with Italy and Sicily. Instead, the first thing he does, even as an opponent of the Swabians, is that he invades everything, and specifically Sicily, where the young Frederick II was, that 
had been adopted after his parents' uh, deaths um, uh, by, by the Pope. Um, and so the reason why the Battle of Bouvines and so the, the whole campaign was so important is that, of course, had the English won, not just they would have maintained the entire Angevin Empire. Probably the French monarchy, as we know it in the Middle Ages, would have not existed. France would have not become the greatest power in the 13th century, probably. The Angevins would have monopolized the entire kind of northwestern part of it and consolidated further while kind of southeastern France would have remained somehow more um, fragmented. There would have been a process of uh, decomposition, literally, of of the Capetian state for ho how they had been building it. Otto IV at that point would have probably consolidated uh, power in Germany. Uh, I don't know by which extent, but um, it uh, surely would have created enormous problems to Frederick II and Wallenstaufen had still he remained in Italy anyway, um, as uh, probably he would, could have not recovered um, uh, power north of the Alps, uh, even though he was uh, in, in the favor, like at that point, of the Pope. Um, and as you understand, an enormous change that depended on that battle. Again, it's also I made a video about the Battle of Bouvines, as you know, you know, a tactical analysis. It's it's an interesting clash, but also pretty standard for the time. It's not even particularly big, etc. Just the the consequences of it are enormous comparatively to to the size, the dimension of the battle. For for you know, yes, there are some interesting aspects of it, but um, let's say that strategically speaking. Um, John had managed to split initially um, the the enemy forces. Thus, he was besieging um, a castle in, in western France, and um, with the Anglo Germans, he managed to threaten Paris itself. So Philip II was obliged to abandon his intent to relieve the siege and went to oppose the the important enemy army that was almost able to catch him un unprepared when he was crossing a river and he gave battle and it was just how it went it went and it went well for france right and after that literally given all the resources and especially the problems that the resources lost and the problems that were occurring um, in england uh, against John's rule because this campaign had been extremely expensive and again almost succeeding in erasing the Capetians. Well, um, you can appreciate at least the, the effort, right? That is definitely considerable and mm, comparatively Richard, even as a great knight, had uh, never handled such a broad strategic situation comparatively right at least in, in as, a, as a broader goal and coming so so close to that magnificent success I mean maybe seizing Jerusalem would have been a greater feat but because of the value of Jerusalem politically religiously etc but in terms of strategic management it, it's a different story there um, John worked much more for it um, so the consequences from France are also obvious. The Capetians took over basically the entire country, even though it took still time to fully uh, crush, let's say, local uh, pockets of, of autonomism. But um, fundamentally, uh, there was no other power challenging the Capetian house uh, in France for a long time. Ironic, un unironically, it would be the same English that would challenge that for dynastic reasons later on uh, and also even succeeding once again at some point during the hundred years war of crushing the Capetian power but in this sense what John is most famous for is is the English consequences of Bouvines because this opened to directly to the rebellions which resulted in the treaty called the Magna Carta which, as you know, limited the royal power and established uh, 
say, what is considered common law, right? It's the base of, uh, like, it would be ideally the first English constitution, uh, in a sense. So th there have been other um, constitutions, um, also throughout the 13th century, that were arguably even more important of the Magna Carta, that consolidated that trend, because at that point it could have been still mitigated. But 1215 is really one of those dates that you remember from all history books um, accordingly, right? So it's the idea that the barons properly say, you know, that there, are, there is a set of rights that we have that essentially have to do with their own, their own personal autonomy as, a, as an estate, right? So mm, it, it was defending their privilege as much as the monarchy would have defended their privilege. And th the rest of the people essentially remained down, right? And England in this sense is a country that by the late Middle Ages, in spite of the and even there, because of the loss of, of France during the Hundred Years' War, it's comparable, right? In some ways, think about not much the, the Wars of the Roses that were, were a bit different, think dynamically, in comparison to what happened with these rebellions. Um, but properly, the, if you want even the isolation of England from the continent, and so also the, the um, uh, actually the less startled, the lesser state of development of the country. There is no doubt about this. I mean, England paid for this uh, in perspective in, in the early modern age, especially um, for the lack of a modernization and updating of its system, because everything was much more still personally ruled as opposed to France that already had by the late Middle Ages a true state, right? And was thus actually the most powerful country in Europe. Well, England could have that. So that's what I, what I, I usually when I talk about English history, I, I always stress this aspect and n not to be a contrarian and not to, let's say, undermine the value of common law per se, which is, I think, uh, one of the most, um, let's say, intelligent, not just important per se, obviously, but juridical cultures in, in history. Um, just, however, consider that these are the beginnings in a context where of course, what was happening politically meant something from what eventually what we have come to know the UK, like in especially in the last centuries, right? This is not even to say that during the 14th or the 15th centuries, England wasn't a hell of a monarchy and a quite unitary one, also due to the fact it had been, had shrank, of course, and I'm not getting in that regard. And it was even, if you think about it, the Hundred Years' War was something that you find rarely um, at, in these historical times, like a country that manages actually to vent its own violence outside of its own country, which is not a few, and thus develops a function that is importantly balanced politically, institutionally. I made lots of videos about this development, and again, as we were saying before, bet in the comparison between England and France, it is interesting to look like, but it's as if at that point, France was the the rotten Goliath because of the 14th century crisis in England that was also suffering by the way mm -hmm. but w being more compact knew how to exploit more right uh, David the, the vulnerabilities of this giant that France had become during the 13th century as a consequence of Bouvines um, talking about John's capacities however I will if you consider first of all there was a a march on London by the ba uh, barons. How he handled that? He just was quite appeasing. He went away. He managed to come back to regain support. The smoothness of it, in spite of the dramatic moment. We're not talking about the 1215, 1216 um, campaigns against the rebels. All across England, even up to Scotland, latitudinally speaking, reaffirming an important degree of monarchic power for what it was possible in a, in a successful way, thus proving, also considering what happened to the country later when William Marshall took over control practically as the protector of the nine-year-old Henry, that our the monarchy had significantly strengthened from a, at least from a statal point of view, that in spite of this enormous blow that had received morally, politically, and the territorial loss, John's harshness, let's say, had provided English monarchs with a more developed 
system of control that in, in a way is the same one that since William the Conqueror, Henry the First, Henry the Second, the Saint John, all these kings had wanted to stress the harsh way, the brutal way, there is no way um, to deny that, but still a hell of a functional one, right, considering the time standards. And all this through this terrible losses, defeats, um, a succession crisis mostly, that had l really worn out, especially the so-called um, anarchy period. It was not really anarchy, but still was the country split in two and both sides ravaging and the north going uh, on its own. So uh, really something that if had been kept as a continuous policy would have probably you know succeeded in creating a super state for medieval standards um, what to say we will naturally talk about um, the Angevin descendants as well because basically that's what they remain uh, like until Bosworth field as a dynasty ruling uh, they are all Plantagenets right um, and um, I I hope to have um, somehow uh, say frame at least certain concept uh, regarding John especially eventually there was always a French interference even the the invasion of England that her wouldn't bring anywhere uh, and uh, at the moment of his death. Uh, just like his brother Geoffrey, he died of the century. Um, this was very common. But during a campaign, still being in charge, still waging war, right? So, not a broken ruler, right? Uh, in a in an absolute sense. Ah, and by the way, what I, I didn't say to was the bargain with with the church during the early rebellions. Uh, John managed to. Mm, essentially receive papal support by granting a tribute to vassalage to the same Rome as, as we've seen this was the norm practically at the peak of again of uh, Catholicism under Innocent III um, and uh, this was seen as a at least historiographically as a negative thing but publicly we don't have evidence that this brought to any significant uh, problem and on the contrary the Pope would always support John henceforth so um, especially in the um, historiography of a Protestant country this may seem a, an issue and in fact let's say there is a sort of, uh, of blame that arrived in the most kind of confessionally influenced um, times historiographically against this um, this uh, this action of John's but again in terms of power maintenance for all the blows that he received during his reign we cannot but but see the success of John's enterprise in here uh, managing to still hold the reins of the country in spite of this enormous blows that probably under any other king would have simply brought the country down to still a, a series of endless uh, wars that surely happened in the rebellions but didn't didn't destroy the, the, the crown Re reduced her um, prerogatives in favor of the baronial ones but still the the, s the English state as such as it was forming those years was secure and England, in this sense, also uh, became much more of a center in itself than, than anything. And not just because, again, the, the French territories had been lost. Because there had been already an attention towards the enormous potential this land presented, especially in the lack of previous feudal institutions that for a while had um, allowed a considerable degree of centralization uh, unknown for example in France right which again is also what I said before consider 
all the Angevin possessions in France were fundamentally in, of that nature instead. So, mm, yeah, that, that's how I would consider the thing. And naturally, for all these introductory videos, we will hopefully make lots of properly in-depth ones relative to specific aspects of these rulers governments and, and so on um, for today however I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye